بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى ال سيدنا محمد ومبارك وسلم دوستان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سو ذس مورنينج سيشن از انتايتلد ساينس راشناليتي اند ذا نيو ايثيزم ناو اي ويل كيپ ريبيتين ذس تو يو ات ذا بيجينينج اوف ايفري سيشن وي ار جوين تو بي دوينغ ا دروب ان ذا اوشن اي ام جيفينغ يو ا بيهايند ذا سينز جلمبس نوت ايفن تور اي ام جيفينغ يو ا سمول فليفر اوف how the islamic scholar tradition what type of methodologies and concepts and understandings exist within our tradition to handle these things otherwise this topic science rationality and the new atheism could be the subject of an entire semester course could be actually even the subject of an entire degree program all right so obviously i cannot teach you all of science and all of, i'm not even qualified to do that i can't even i'm not it's not i'm not a phd in physics right I want to teach you from this vantage point because there's a big confusion out there that does Islamic scholarship have a perspective on science? Does it have a vantage point on science? Is that perspective and vantage point academically robust? Is it significant? Is it able to address those issues where outwardly, initially, apparently, science seems to try to contradict areas of Islamic belief and faith? All right? Okay, Bismillah. So you are there. All right. So first we have to begin with some basic terminology. Some basic terminology. I'm going to read these words out for you and then we're going to have to look at all these things one by one. Truth, reality, objectivity, subjectivity, relativity, true and false, and verification and falsification. These are some of the buzzwords that are used in this discussion of science and rationality. especially when people are discussing concepts of religion so let's take number one truth Now obviously there's many philosoph- philosophical ways that a person can describe truth one way is if i want to relate it to the slide itself truth is that which corresponds to reality and interestingly that one philosophical formulation is there in ilmul kalam the ilmul kalam remember i told you was a science of theology that you're entirely unaware of because people are more involved in ilm al-aqaid sunni sect shia sect this sect that this sect this this sect that sect <laughs> right but ilm al-kalam is almost virtually unknown still to the majority of educated muslims today in ilm al-kalam there's a huge discussion on this what is sidq and what is kizb or sometimes it's called kadhib in arabic what is truth and what is false you find volumes on this also all right So very simply I'm going to start with this because this is basically science operates on the principles of rationality and empiricism and demonstrable proofs. So truth is that which is demonstrated through some scientific method to be demonstrated to be that which corresponds to reality. Right? In Arabic we say it's mutabiq al-waqi' or mutabiq nafs al-amr in correspondence to what exists in reality. So what is reality then? Now reality is that which exists separately and independently from us. That's what's called what's real. Now if you want to go to the ilm al-kalam discussion on this, a very interesting discussion is when they talk about Allah Ta'ala's attributes, Asma al-Husna, and one of his names is Al-Haq. And to the extent that Allah Ta'ala is capital R, real, relative to that, I mean relative is coming, relative to that everything else is unreal. Right? but from a scientific empirical perspective reality is that which is separately observable and known separately observable and known but if you move into the area of like neuroscience and psychology it's big question mark that my thoughts are the quote unquote real are my dreams real what empirical basis do my dreams have i tell you i had a dream last night is that real is it true am i speaking the truth Let's say you believe I'm speaking the truth. Is there any way you can scientifically test that? Is that empirical? Is that falsifiable? It's just a claim I will make, right? It's a claim I will make. To if you insist to take that way of life, that every single thing must be understood by science. Well, this is a perfect example. Your dreams, to the, what extent are they real, and to what extent did you truly see them? This is not fully able to be captured by science. 
No doubt cognitive science will try to deconstruct the brain into its different chemical, neurochemical reactions and different parts of the brain, but still no true cognitive scientist neuroscientist will tell you that we have a complete scientific, exclusively scientific understanding of how and exactly why people dream. Just one example, right? But in the other example, in layman's terms, if I asked you, are dreams a reality? You will say, yes. I say, why? You probably say, because I've had a dream myself. So but I say, but that's not empirical. That's not falsifiable. That doesn't pass the scientific method. So you will give another way of saying, I know that when you say, I had a dream myself, what you're saying is knowledge by experience. That's something different by knowledge by demonstration. All right? Okay. But here, I'll come back to this thing. Objectivity. Right? Objectivity. Now, is there any such real thing as objectivity? Is there one single perception, understanding of reality that can be called quote-unquote objective? And a lot of philosophers, they say no. On the other hand, if everything is subjective and you have complete subjectivity, then you end up in this notion of complete relativity. Now, let's say somebody tries to put forth, like in phil philosophy and logic, they'll put forth a proposition. Right? So let's say somebody puts forth this proposition to you that uh, there is no objective reality. There's no way I can have an objective proof that proves that statement. If I take the opposite extreme, that there is no subjectivity, there's no objective proof I can use to prove that statement. So logic was a tool that was used, and this was a very important thing that we should know that in the Aristotelian world, logic was basically the litmus test for any quote-unquote scientific type statement. And this is one of the great things that Imam al-Ghazari incorporated. And he took all of Aristotelian logic in its entirety, right? And when you take that logic, you will realize that a lot of statements you make, they're claims but you cannot logically prove them. Okay, if I say, okay, there's both. There's some objectivity and subjectivity. I still can't logically prove that. That may resonate with us. So that's something else. That's not called science. That's called intuition. Intuition means that statement that resonates with you to be true based on your own experience and understanding of the world. Now, when I say own experience and understanding of the world, again, that's back to subjectivity. But shouldn't truth be something that's objective? Then if you ask the question of religion, isn't Allah Ta'ala actually suggesting that in Quran? When he says, Afala yaqilun? That he's given you an aql, that if you use it, you will be able to arrive at the ultimate single objective truth, which is the belief in the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So believe me, Ilmul Kalam, they talk about this stuff a lot. It's a mistake that you think that oh, philosophy and science are the first people to ever talk about these things. But you're not conversant and versed in the classical Arabic scholarly tradition of your own deen, right? Okay? Here, this is the first slide, so I, I mean, I'm trying to keep track of time as well. True and false, verification and falsification. By true and false, I mean to declare something decisively to be true and to declare something decisively to be false. Now, again, you will have... You see, this requires, if you take it back to what we did yesterday, and I didn't put those words up for you again, but if you can definitively declare something to be true, then that means you invalidate everything else. There's no multiplicity left. Multiplicity is gone, right? And if you definitively declare something to be false, you are in that process of invalidation and elimination. Now, science, at one level, they put forth an hypothesis... When they're fairly sure something is true, they call it a theory. But as you know, there have been times, and up till right now, the cutting edge of science, they're constantly revisiting and reconsidering their theories, and sometimes they disprove their own theories. The most famous example of this was the theory of the universe, Ptolemy, right? That he felt, no, the earth was the center of the universe. Now, when you look at demonstration, his model that put the earth as the center of the universe and the sun rotating around the earth, but that did perfectly, and still today, can perfectly predict the stars and constellations that will appear in the sky. So if you say science is about demonstration or empiricism, well actually, that method of astronomy, passes the test of demonstration and empiricism. And all of the astrologers, right, and all the astronomers, made these models, 
spinning the earth as the center, viewing, thinking the earth to be the center, and that the sun is rotating around us, and they could completely accurately predict the constellations of the stars in the sky. But today me and you know that that's not true. <laughs> earth is not the center. The sun is the center. And therefore, because the sun is the center, it's a solar system. And the earth is the one that's revolving around the sun. Now that, fine, 100% I accept that. But interestingly, that additional scientific truth did not in any way help humanity from being able to observe the stars. It didn't ex the, the prediction of the constellation of the stars and navigation from stars was perfect in the Ptolemaic system. But technically it was scientifically untrue. So what is untrue and what is false? So they used the untrue system to navigate the oceans of this world with complete accuracy. So it's a relative thing. You're talking about frames of reference here. All right? Okay. Now, if I try to say that also, all truths are relative. Let's say I say this. Even that I can't prove to you objectively. There's no demonstration. Even if I try to take that route, I take the next one. Right? So all truths are relative. Even for that, there is no objective, quote-unquote, empirical, scientific, definitive, decisive proof like science can offer. So basically, all of these things cannot be determined and decided by science. And these are the fundamental things. <laughs> these are the fundamental things. What is true and what is false? To some, it doesn't mean science can never do this. So that's why the last line is there. When science realizes that there are some things that it can make this determination, so it's called a verification and a falsification. So how do you test a hypothesis? The first thing is that the hypothesis must be constructed in such a way that its premises are falsifiable. And then what you do is you keep trying to falsify them. So you run these experiments and you run the centrifuge and you just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And you keep getting generating sets of data and you're constantly trying to falsify. But even then, strictly speaking, in a strict pure philosophy of science, you're reaching at the highest approximation of certainty that you can, but you can still never say you've achieved certainty. For example, if I tell you that, okay, scientists have said that, I can't remember what it is now, but XYZ is the speed of light. Okay, but if I say that did you factor in the particles of dust in that speed of light? Did you calculate the speed of light in a vacuum? Did you calculate with dust? You're saying the speed of light, you say, when the stars, so we're seeing stars that no longer exist anymore, and you calculate the distance of those stars also using the speed of light. But how much particles were in the way? First of all, there's empty space, there's nothing there. But along the way, maybe there were some asteroid belts, there may be so many things. Did you factor these things into your speed of light? They will say, no, no, no. Because we, it's like calculus. The limit of x as it approaches 5, treat it as 5. I say, it's not x equals 5, I say x is approaching 5. They say, but if x keeps approaching 5, then you will just take that approximation as a certainty that x becomes 5. All of math is based on this principle. x isn't 5 though. The limit of x as it approaches 5, treat it as 5. So that's what they're saying. That No, no, we basically, at the a very high level approximation, this is the speed of light. We haven't been able to counter, we have no idea that what type of space matter or asteroid or star, some star burst and that, that light traveled from that star through that remnants of that star matter to us and how that star matter may have affected the speed of light. We have no idea of these things. So it's an approximation. Now it's approximation based on human ability. So it means that to whatever extent the human is able to try to falsify the hypothesis. He must try all of his ways to falsify it. And if it passes that falsification test, then we will verify it. But then if you ask the philosophical question, is the human ability to falsify that hypothesis, is it complete? They'll say, no, it's approximate. Is it absolute? they say, no, it's approximate. If I ask science itself the question, that could science itself in 10 years discover another way to possibly falsify this hypothesis, they will say, yes. In fact, we're trying, that's what we love to do. This is one, one area of scientific research and progress and invention, is to discover new ways to test, quote-unquote, tried and true theories. So it's all relative. <laughs> it's a frame of reference. It's all relative. All right? But in terms of the present, in terms of the state of the art, they will declare a hypothesis to be a theory today because to whatever extent scientific ability is able to falsify that hypothesis, it's attempted to falsify it and it hasn't been able to falsify it, therefore it will view it as a theory to be true and they will verify it. 
But it's still, they don't say that it's hatman, qat'an, it's definitive, decisive for all of eternity. So actually the realm of religion and revelation is totally different. There's no encroachment here. Encroachment would be if science is also making a claim to capture eternal truths. No, the science doesn't make that claim. It says it can change any day. It can change any day. All right? Okay. So anyway, these just just few terms. I had to move beyond the first slide. But I mean, even just this slide could be talked about for hours. And not just in our ilm al tradition, in the tradition of philosophy of science, and scientists themselves, and pure philosophers, have written tons of books on these things. What is objectivity? What is relativity? What does it mean to falsify? So there's huge workshops on this. That I would also like to pause. That now when you're building this workshop, like on the workshop on this slide, it doesn't mean that the workshop only has to have Quran and Hadith. No. If you want to play this game, right, and understand this, you're perfectly allowed in Sharia, and in certain cases you may very well need to put the writings of the scientists and philosophers right there in the workshop. The only difference is, is that the Qur'an takes a higher level of precedence on that workshop, but it doesn't mean these things aren't allowed. This is also a myth. Uh, and I didn't actually bring that for you, but Imam Ghazali and our fine friend here, or I don't know where he is, he walked in, lady sitting somewhere in the back, but Imam Ghazali has actually mentioned, there he is, right? Uh, whether he counseled individual people accordingly or not is a separate matter, but his own personal view about science and math was that there's nothing in it that is against religion. But he did see that there were individuals who got misled by some myths and realities and misunderstandings about science and math. But science and math in of themselves have nothing in them that are against religion. Right? I will come that the science of today has put forth a couple of things, such as human evolution, we're going to come to that later, that clearly is a concept that is against direct, clear, scriptural revelation. All right? And that's also a very interesting thing. And this may also be a reason why in the vast majority of the history of humanity, the overwhelming majority of scientists were not atheists because the scientific discoveries and theories and understandings up till that time do not actually have anything in it that would necessi necessitate atheism. But obviously if a person comes to the belief in human evolution and believes that Sayyidina Adam had parents, it's not even a question of man being descended from apes because Islam says Sayyidina Adam Islam didn't even have human parents, right? So it's a totally different thing. It's not even about evolution if you think about it in some way. It's about miracles. We believe that Sayyidina Adam didn't even have human parents. If science says that you get a scientist, maybe it might happen 20 years from now, they deny evolution. Maybe they do it. But they'll still say that Adam Islam had parents. <laughs> they will say that. They, say it wasn't, they won't accept that he was created from nowhere, right? So that itself is a difference. But that theory wasn't there. So most of the scientists were completely comfortable in their Jewish or Christian faith because the science of their time and day did not really have anything that felt necessitated them to abandon their faith. All right? So that's why I mentioned this term of new atheism because it's not like they weren't atheists before, but they were atheists before for philosophical reasons, not for scientific reasons. But the new atheism, and this is the term used in academia, is that atheism which is purportedly, supposedly born out of science. And that confuses the person, because we all agree with science. Now the earlier atheism that was born out of a particular philosophy, so a Muslim will say, well fine, I don't believe in that philosophy, I believe in the Quran and the Sunnah, so that's not an issue for me. But the new atheism becomes an issue, because the new atheism, if it really is born from science, and I believe in science, so then what does that mean? This is a question, does science necessitate atheism? All right, clear. So let's go step by step. Now if you answer, ask this question, does God exist? Right? So for us, does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exist? Right? Now if you answer yes, if you answer yes, you are going to face three criticisms from the atheist. Number one, that your claim is not scientific and therefore false, for only that which is contained in science is true. Right? Second, your claim is not logical. You cannot give me a logical proof for the existence of God. Therefore, your claim is false. Third, your claim is not rational. There is no rational basis for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So therefore, it's false. So what you have here is science, logic, and rationality. Right? These are basically the first principles. These are the first principles. All right. 
So basically what we're going to have to look at is a bit of all of these three things. Now the so now I'm on slide number eight. The numbers are on the bottom right corner, bottom right corner, very small and in very light gray, where they should be large and bold faced black. Yeah, the numbers are on the bottom right corner, so I'm on slide number eight. Slide number eight. So there's a word that has been coined, it's called scientism. A word that has been coined is called scientism. What is scientism? All right. Now, scientism is, number one, a world view. It's something different than science. That's why it's having this word, ism. Scientism is a world view that whatever you will view to be true and false will be on the basis of science. Science is the way you understand. Scientism means that science is the way you will understand everything. Science normally meant that this is the way we will understand the material world. And normally scientists actually did not try to investigate the immaterial world or have questions about that. They didn't actually try to view the ruh or the kalb or even mind and thought and consciousness as part of their domain. Classically, science didn't have this realm of neuroscience. This is the latest thing, this is part of scientism, that neuroscience was created. Otherwise before, ideas were understood through philosophy, right? But now, scientism is the belief that every single thing can be understood on the basis of science. So instead of psychology, psychiatry, instead of philosophy, neuroscience, or cognitive behavior, right? You understand. And now genetics is also a very important ingredient of scientism because the cutting edge of genetics is trying to discover behavioral genes. The notion that a human being is genetically programmed to certain kinds of behavior, right? And Allah Alam, if they ever discovered the taqwa gene, they might take it out. <laughs> they might take it out if they had to discover there's some gene which is to iman, behavior of iman and taqwa and behavior of haya, they'll take it out. But this is what they... Now, they don't say this is a theory. This is a, a, a hypothesis. They, it's, it's research. They're not saying it's fact. But it's, you know, like I told you, the ideology-based approach which takes place knowledge, some of them are doing as an ideology. Or maybe I should pause and explain that to you. You see, when you choose to deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to come up with an alternate understanding of the world. And when you take that denial so far in scientism that science alone can understand everything, then you end up denying a lot of philosophy, a lot of psychology, a lot of other things. Because it's not just denial of religion. Scientism is not just a denial of religion. It's a denial of any way of understanding, explaining, engaging the world. It's inherently against aesthetics and art and creativity. Or it tries to explain all aesthetics and art and creativity in terms of neuroscience and cognitive and the left side of the brain. Right? But an artist will tell you that, no, no, it's my creative spirit. It's not because I have certain, I have a different set of neurons in the left side of my brain than that one does. No, they will insist, I have a more creative spirit than that person does. I have a greater imagination than that person does. They say, no, no, all this, this is all bunk. <laughs> all your creative spirit, imagination, that's all fluff. It's all basically difference in your cognitive behavior, your cognitive thinking power on the left side of your brain. That's called scientism. It's not just a denial of religion, do you understand? It's an entire world view. Now, most atheists now, it's actually not science, it's scientism that they're following. It's scientism that they're following. All right? Now, yes, there are definitely many scientists who are following this. There are atheist scientists who follow this. And those of you who, there may be a few who are aware of this, there's this huge, huge literature in English language. Dawkins, Hitchens, oh, there's so many of them. And some of them are pure physicists. Some of them are pure mathematicians. Some of them are pure philosophers. And they're on both sides. Mostly this is taking place in the Christian world. So you have completely believing Christian evolutionary biologists, completely believing Christian pure particle physicists, completely believing Christian philosophers. I actually studied under one of each in Oxford, right? And you have completely atheist all of the above. And you have several of them, dozens of them. And they are massive literature that they're writing, engaging each other, discussing each other. On the fringes, there are certain extremists. <laughs> Uh, you, can, you could say, you, you would seem to be like sectarianism to you. <laughs> the way they talk about each other in fatwas of kufr, it's like some of them have extreme hatred and extreme horrific tones that they use. But those are the margins. 
there's actually a very large way that this debate is taking, debate, discussion, interaction, engagement is taking place in a more considered and thoughtful manner. And volumes and volumes have been written on these topics. The point of telling you all this is don't fall into that assumption that every physicist, every mathematician, every philosopher is necessarily atheist. No, no, there's nowhere near the case in UK, US, and Canada right now. All right? And here, uh, the, why am I telling you this right now is because those people, they don't deny science. It's about scientism. It's all about this thing. That's why they coined this word to say it's not about science. I'm also a physicist. I'm also a math- Not me. Those people would talk like that, that I'm also a biologist. It's nothing to do with science. It's about scientism. It's about how you will understand their claim. It's about how you will choose to understand matters that fall outside the realm of science. Now, the scientists say nothing falls outside the realm of science. Therefore, everything should be understood through science. These believing scientists are saying that there are some things that fall outside of science and we are happy and comfortable understanding those things on the basis of revelation, scripture, and prophethood in whatever faith system they may personally ascribe to. All right. So, scientism is a worldview. Only science and knowledge derived from science contain truth. Everything else is merely belief, superstition, and myth. These are three buzzwords that they use. Because in the scientific approach has then trickled down into the liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences. So then uh, you will find very scientific anthropologists. So the anthropology of religion will be what? Anthropology of religion means that all religion is just superstition and myth and a product of culture. And you will find scientific sociology. What does that mean? That all religion that exists at a societal level, like Marx said, religion, the opium of the masses, right? So it's trickled in. So the words that are used when the scientific outlook enters, the humanities, social science, and liberal arts, is this, that everything else is just belief, superstition, and myth. Belief here, they don't mean iman. By belief, they mean something that's not really knowledge. It's fluff. It's fluff. All right? Okay. Now, let's examine this notion of scientism. Right? So, like I told you, there are believing scientists who have tried to refute scientism. Nobody's trying to refute science. But I'm going to come to the issue of evolution at the end. All right. Now, to understand this very clearly, I'm not talking about science now, I'm talking about scientism. The first thing is called the self-refuting test. Now, interestingly, what happens is, how will scientism be refuted? It's not going to be refuted through Quran and Sunnah in the first instance. Scientism is going to be refuted through logic and philosophy. So you have logic and philosophy taking on scientism. In this discussion about can everything be understood through science, or are there some things that cannot be understood through science? All right? Okay. First thing is called the self-refuting test. All right. Self-refuting test means that uh, if you accept the proposition... Remember, like I told you, the box. So if you accept the position and you flush out its consequences, the consequences itself negate the position in the box. It's self-refuting. So you take a position. If you weren't here yesterday, this is something I talked about yesterday. So the box. Remember, I told you how to run the box. So you will take a position. You will flush out its necessary logical implications and consequences. And the self-refuting test means you take a proposition, you flush out its necessary logical implications and consequences, and if it turns out that those necessary implications actually would necessitate refutation of the proposition in the first place, it's a self-refuting proposition. So I actually don't need to refute it. The proposition's claim to be truth actually refutes itself. Now, if it just claimed to be a hypothesis, that's not going to work. But when it claims to be truth, now this is what scientism is. This is why the self-refuting test is applied to scientism. Because they're not saying we're just yet another hypothesis. Maybe it is philosophy, maybe it is psychology. No. They're saying this is it. (laughs) This is the ultimate empirical, demonstrable, rational truth. The only way to understand the world is this scientific method. All right. So, now let's take an example of this. Number one. Uh, Number one is the statement itself that true knowledge is that which is contained in science and found through scientific methods. This sentence itself is not part of science. This sentence itself cannot be proved through the scientific method. You see what I'm saying? This sentence itself, true knowledge, is only that which, I should have added the word only, 
True knowledge is only that which is contained in science and found through scientific methods. This sentence itself cannot prove itself. This sentence is not contained in science. This sentence cannot be proven through the scientific method. Therefore, if this sentence is true, this sentence is false. <laughs> Do you understand? It's called a logical fallacy. It's pure philosophical logic and syllogism that is used in the self-refuting test. It has nothing to do with religion versus science. Don't couch this debate in religion versus science. The way you frame a debate, often that itself decides the victor and loser in the debate. Yeah? <laughs> if you talk about religion versus science, well, then I'll, I'll, all the Muslim students who are studying chemistry and engineering and physics, as well, I've got to choose religion versus science. It's not. It's religion versus scientism. It's science versus scientism. It's logic and philosophy versus scientism. Okay, let's look at the second thing. True knowledge must be observable. Can you observe that statement? Can you observe? Is there any empirical observation to this statement? True knowledge must be observable. You understand? You're getting a feel for this? This is a statement. True knowledge must be observable. Can you observe the truth of that? You can accept that as a first basis. So that's why actually scientism is another religion. It requires iman in these things. It requires to accept something as your first principles and then understand everything on the basis of those first principles. So actually the choice is you want to accept Allah Ta'ala's first principles in Quran or you want to accept the scientist's first principles. Third, true knowledge should be testable. Can you test this sentence? And this sentence itself, is it testable? No. <laughs> so then it's not true knowledge. Because true knowledge is only, I, I should have really added the word only here, true knowledge is only that which is testable. This sentence itself is not testable, therefore it's not true knowledge. Are you getting a feel for this self-refuting test? Next, true knowledge is only that which is empirically verifiable. Empirically, because it's slightly different, scientific method may have some things that are beyond your empirical senses, right? So like a given example, say, oh, if you see it, you'll believe it, right? <coughs> Only that which I see will I believe. But this sentence itself, did you see that somewhere? <laughs> did you see this somewhere? Now, if it's us, you say, yes, we saw it in Quran. <laughs> we could give an answer to that. But what would the scientist say? Where did you see it? This sentence. Hmm? Self-refuting. True knowledge must be refutable. Is this sentence itself refutable? <laughs> How would you refute that sentence? This is a bit tricky one. True knowledge must be falsifiable. Let me keep it easier for you there. Can you falsify this? This proposition that true knowledge must be falsifiable. How will you do that? Hmm? How will you do that? You have, an, for example, true knowledge is only that which is empirically verifiable. So I tell you the number two, or the number one, even the concept of numbers. Can you see, smell, touch, taste, hear that concept? Not re if you take empiricism in its basic, because empiricism can mean more than that, but if you take it from that level, you would say no, right? I can't see, smell, touch, hear the number two, but it's a concept, it's, it's a real concept. I have two pens, I have two watches, I have two laptops, right? All right, so this is one, one small thing. It's a small thing, right? It's a very small thing. But the point is that it, it's going back to what I showed you. So if you go back to page six, if you go back to slide number six, these things, it's not easy to figure these things out. Truth, f falsehood, relativity, subjectivity, objectivity. And basically these are claims. If you go back to page nine, slide number nine, these are statements and claims, but they don't pass the self-refuting test. It means these are not true, these are not objective truths. These are the subjective truths adopted by the scientific worldview and approach. And fair enough, they're free to do that. They're free to do that, but to take a claim of objectivity for that, and then to take an exclusive claim of truth for that, and then to falsify and invalidate every other thing, there's no scientific, ba there's no basis within their own system to do that. And it's not based on logic either. All right. Next is this question of what exactly is science, right? What is science? How do you separate science from non-science? So for example, you will find in 
the Western Academy that why were some of the liberal arts called social sciences and why were the other ones called humanities? Hmm? Is psychology a social science? Some psychology departments are unhappy. They say, we want to be in the School of Science and Engineering. We're a science. The scientists say, no, you're not a science. Go to the social sciences school. Hmm? Allah Akbar. What is science? What is non-science? Hmm? Is there any... Go back to <laughs> slide number six. Is there any objective, falsifiable, verifiable, absolute way to determine this question? Or is it relative? <laughs> is it relative? What do, going back to slide number 10. What is science and how do you separate science from non-science? All right. There is a writer's name is Larry Loudon, L-A-U-D-A-N. He wrote a book, Science at the, uh, an article, si essay, a Science at the Bar. Science at the Bar, where he talks about this very interesting. It's a very interesting, a very uh, enjoyable piece to read, put it that way, right? About this notion of what is science and what is not science. Right Now, if somebody says that a statement that let's go back to one of their first principles, so what's falsifiable? Right? So if I was to just say this proposition to you, that Martians will land on this earth in 2050, or for that matter, humans will land on Mars in 2050. Right? Now, you can't refute that. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. Right? So what does that mean? Is science now? Because any falsifiable test you can apply, you can't falsify that statement. You will have to be open to the possibility. So remember, science was when you keep falsifying, keep falsifying, keep falsifying, that you get this approximation of certainty. Why? Because to the best of your knowledge, you've eliminated any possibility of truth. Oh, sorry, and any possibility of falsehood. Right? But how can you falsify that statement? You say, I have no idea. Okay, let's say I take 2,500. In the year 2,500, humans will be living on Mars. You can't falsify that. So does that make it science? Because you can't falsify it? That's so f can I call it a scientific statement? You would say, no, that does you can't call it a scientific statement. But I say, no, science is what you can't falsify. And you can't falsify the statement. You're getting an idea, right? Of these internal contradictions on these issues. I'm not talking about internal conditions of what you read in your chemistry textbook. We fully accept what's the periodic table. That's science. I'm talking about scientism. <laughs> what's in the physics and chemistry textbook, that's science. Right? This is scientism. Trying to negate any other, going back to slide six, any other understanding of truth and claiming pure objectivity only for themselves. That's scientism. All right. Now let's go back to slide number 10. If you go back to slide number 10, uh, let's look at some other things uh, that we may accept as knowledge, right? That we may accept as knowledge. So one issue is this issue, like I told you, of intuition, right? Now intuition is used, but I put, I put it on the bottom of my empirical adequacy, your intuition is going to guide you on how many factors or causalities you have to look at in any scientific experiment, right? So for example, if somebody said that, okay, science told us that there was an earthquake in China and it measured 8.2 on the Richter scale, and if I tell them that did you take into account the weight of coal in the coal mines in China, and maybe because the weight of the coal in the coal mines was heavier, it really was an 8.4 scale earthquake, but it came out at a reading at 8.2 on your reading because there was some, this no, no, that's a negligible factor. These things are negligible. Then I, I could come up with something nonsensical. I said, did you run any scientific tests to see that did the prices of tea in China affect the level of the earthquake? They say, that's nonsensical, right? But I say, no, no, but it's a hypothesis. I want you to falsify it. I mean, if I talk like that, they'll say, no, who has time for that, right? If you talk like that, then there are a billion factors that could have to be examined. So you don't, so there's an intuition. So this is also a myth, a fallacy of falsification, that we did eliminate everything humanly possible. No. First, you used your intuition to eliminate the nonsensical and the absurd. Then you used your intuition to eliminate things that had negligible effect. 
and only those things that your intuition told you possibly had a tangible effect, you ran your falsifiability test on those things that you thought had a tangible effect. But how did you decide that? What was a tangible and what was a negligible and what was nonsensical? That's your intuition. In our tradition we call it zok. And you, I mean, this I won't be able to train you in, but in the, and this is why, you know, in Hadith studies, you can't just copy somebody in the 20th century who tells you this Hadith is weak. The muhaddithin had zok. They had an acumen. They had a flair for this. They were hafiz al hadith They had memorized 100,000 chains of narration. They had seen that narrator narrating from so many people. If they didn't tag him as Zaif, you can't do your database research and say, oh, I've discovered today the so-and-so scholar in 20th century Saudi Arabia decided so-and-so is Zaif. He doesn't have that zok. <laughs> He's using a laptop. <laughs> He's using a library. These guys had it up here. It's their zok. It's their intuition. If you ask any scientist who won the Nobel Prize or any great inventor, how did you do that? Was it just empirical method? He said, no, no, it was my intuition. <laughs> I had a hunch. I had intuition that this would work. <laughs> All the way from Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison, whoever it is, whoever invented, whatever it is, it's intuition. Intuition is the creative force behind science. <laughs> and you can't factor that in anywhere. All right? So this is what I was telling you about this empirical adequacy or if you want to call it empirical inadequacy. If you insist that they should factor in the negligible and nonsensical, then we will say it's empirical inadequacy. But they say, no, it's empirical adequacy. Why is it adequate? Because we factor it as tangible. How did you define, determine that? That's just intuition. That's not science. Now scientists are fine with that. Scientism is not fine. Scientism is shattered by this. Scientists have no problem with what I'm saying. This Yes, 100%. We use intuition. We don't make any claim that everything, every single way of knowing is going to be captured by science. They believe in even inspiration. And many of the great, greatest scientists in history were believers, and they would even write in their autobiographies that I was inspired by God. And now the scientist today will say, no, that's all fluff. He experienced a cognitive moment. A cognitive moment, a surge of neurons and electrical activity in his brain. He thought that was inspiration by God. Again, an attempt to falsify another person's understanding of an event that actually lies outside the realm of science. I mean, are you a greater scientist or is Einstein a greater scientist? <laughs> right? It, or if science necessitates atheism, then why in the world weren't these great scientists atheists themselves? Alright? Okay. Then uh, there's this thing called the theory of uniformity. Alright? Theory of uniformity. Now, theory of uniformity is, for example, that you take a law, let's say the law of gravity. So to make it a law, the theory of uniformity means these things have to be uniform. It means gravity must be universally the same at any point on Earth. Barring some other, ceteris paribus, what they say, barring some other extenuating circumstance and condition. But empirical method would mean you had to test it in all these conditions. You can't just make a claim like that. And then here you have empirical inadequacy out of, let's say, how many latitude GPS points on Earth has the gravity been measured? It's probably not even 10% of the places on Earth, right? So what is that? It's your intuition. And it very interestingly, at in the Ilm al-Kalam tradition, this intuitive element that you have tested something at a level which is sufficient to give you certainty, that concept is called tawatur in our deen. That concept is called Tawatur. And the Tawatur concept is actually used in our deen as well to bring certain knowledge. That you have received something through Tawatur. So to give you an example, Imam Ghazali gives that if one person walked in this room right now and said it's raining outside. They just pretend there's no window, just pretend it's all four walls. Now when one person says it to you, you may not have certain belief. Right? But if two people come in, three people come in, Five people come in. At some point, there will be the quote-unquote tipping point. At some point, you will reach a number of reports and narrations where, it's not science, your heart, your intuitive heart will feel the feeling of certainty. You will look in your heart and say, yes, now my heart feels certain that indeed it is raining. Then it may also have to do with how well you know those report givers, how true you know them to be, how upright you know them to be. This is what the muhaddith was doing when he was tagging. 
Now, yes, the Hadith scholars made a few comments that so-and-so is this and so-and-so is that, but those comments are just a drop in their ocean of knowledge about that narrator and their feel about that narrator. The modern-day researcher goes to the books of Ilm al-Rijal and looks at the narrator and sees a slightly lower comment and says, oh, I've discovered this Hadith is Zayf that all these fuqaha were using for these 1200 years. He says, you didn't discover anything. You just discovered that the muhaddisin all accepted the Hadith even though for all these centuries they knew that that one narrator critic did make that one comment, but they disregarded that comment on the basis of their intuition. And you think you're a hero because you discovered that comment. And you want to change the gradings of Hadith of the great Hadith scholars. So Tawatr. Tawatr. Right? But, what are they saying? That when we reach a certain level of Tawatr, we will view that these things behave in a uniform manner. But that uniformity is not actually your individual thing that you saw behave in that way. You dropped a ball, you saw it behave in a particular way of gravity, but you extrapolate. It's an extrapolation. Now it's not absurd, like I'm, I'm not negating. Science is doing it right. A reasonable level of approximation, a reasonable amount of falsification based on their intuition until they reach the level of certainty. But when they reach that level of certainty, they make a leap and they make the claim of uniformity. And we're fine with that. And up till now it bears out. But strictly speaking, according to scientism, that leap is not warranted. That leap is unfounded. That leap is not acceptable. But for us and for science, it's acceptable. This is something called the Raven Paradox. Raven paradox means that, okay, you were trying to count... Raven is a particular type of bird. A type of type of bird. And the notion is that all ravens are black. Right? Okay, now if you make a statement like that, so how would you do that? Right? So scientists will tell you, well, what we did is we used observation. And we kept looking at ravens and we kept seeing them to be black. We kept looking at ravens, we kept seeing them in black. We, kept, we, we, we traveled around, we looked at raven populations, we went to raven nests, we l tried to discover where they live, and we kept seeing them in are black. But at some point, they made this statement, all ravens are black. Now how many did you see? You saw a hundred, you saw a thousand. The point is, you didn't see all of them. <laughs> you didn't see all of them, and then say the statement, all ravens are black. You saw some of them. You saw many of them. You may have seen a great many of them, right? Now the way actually to have strictly speaking to make a statement, because remember, you're talking about objective absolutism now. I didn't put that relativity in absolutism. This is an absolute statement. All ravens are black. It's an absolute statement, right? Now, today, yes, because the raven paradox is a little bit earlier, today it might be possible that maybe somebody... Does, uh, takes out the gene, takes out some cell matter of a raven, right? And tries to analyze its genes and maybe suggest that the pigment gene or, right, or the pigment chromosome is only programmed in them to be black, right? But still, the question would be that could there be any alternate subspecies of raven out there that have a slightly genetic, different genetic makeup? So there's a certain intuition, a certain tawatr principle that you'll end up saying all ravens are black. And the, all of science is based on these things. The theory of uniformity, the Raven paradox, this notion of approximations of certainty. Right? Now the way science regulates itself is certain standards. It's not arbitrary. There will be peer review. There will be articles written in the journal. The scientific community will have to accept the research of that scientist. And that may take a few years for them to then say, yes, we accept that theory, and then now we will uniformly, we will also use it in our own research and our experiments. That t it's a process, it's a time, it's not arbitrary. It's a structured, governed, regulated process. All right? Okay. So this covers a few more concepts in this con from the philosophy of science. Now, uh, this was to suggest to you that the existence of Allah Ta'ala is beyond science. So this was the answer, if you go back to slide number... Uh, where was it? Slide number seven. That if does God exist, you will be faced with these questions. So the first one is your claim is not scientific and therefore false for only that which is contained in science is true. 
This was the answer to that. No, not only what is contained in science is true. Then the next two things was that your claim is not logical and your claim is not rational. That is slide 7. So now go forward up to slide number 11. Slide number 11. Now there are different, there's a whole range here. There's a whole range here. I'm just going to give you a couple of things. A couple of things. There's a whole range. All right. The first thing that is mentioned here is called the fine-tuning argument. Now, like I mentioned to you, I attended a whole bunch of series of lectures at Oxford, uh, probably 40 to 50 of them. One by a, pure, a professor of pure mathematics, me, he's a pure math theory. And one by a renowned philosopher, Brian Leftow, who's also a Christian believer, and he taught courses on the philosophy of religion. All right. Now, this is one notion of creation. Now, some of you who are aware of these debates in America, intelligent design, creationism, right? Versus the blind watchmaker, versus no watchmaker. There are certain buzzwords that are used in this literature. One such term is called the fine-tuning argument. The fine-tuning argument means that the Earth's conditions are so finely tuned to create the possibility of the existence of life. And although science certainly, and Islam doesn't necessarily have to negate this, but science is open to the possibility that life may exist elsewhere, what we call extraterrestrial life, but up till now science says there is absolutely no scientific evidence proof of the existence of extraterrestrial life. So even from today's state of the art science, the current knowledge although open to the possibility that there may be life in other planets and other worlds, but the current knowledge is that there's only life on Earth. Now, obviously, when you investigate that, there's certain reasons for that. Fine-tuning means, for example, if the Earth was a bit closer to the Sun, or even a bit further away from the Sun, life would not be possible on Earth, because the temperature climate wouldn't be conducive to Earth. Fine-tuning means if the Earth, the speed in which the Earth rotates around its axis, if it was somewhat slower or somewhat greater, it would be more difficult to obtain life on Earth. There's so many, many factors, which are even actually, even science will say, we've only identified, there are also going to be some that we have yet to identify. Because no scientist claims that we know all the laws of the universe. No scientist claims that. No scientist who does anatomy and physiology can still claim we understand everything about the human body. There are so many diseases still, they say we have not identified a cure, nor do we know the cause. So what does that mean? I accept also that the disease is happening through a scientific process. I accept that. But science is itself saying we don't have full understanding of this process, of this one disease. What causes the disease? We don't know. How are you going to cure the disease? We don't know. I'm not saying that means the disease is some paranormal, psychological, spiritual thing. No. 100% the disease is physical, material, in the realm of science. It's the subject matter of science. But science doesn't know about it yet. This is a fact of so many things, right? So if it's true about the human body, you can imagine the extent that it's true about the universe. But they say to whatever we know right now, there's no life anywhere else. Now this fine-tuning argument is this notion that what is the probability of that? Now the counter to this that some atheist scientists put forth is called the multiverse argument. And literally one of them actually has this idea that imagine out of creation is... Like, imagine there's some machine that just creates universes. And sooner or later, the laws of probability would demand and dictate that a universe would eventually be created over trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of years. Eventually, a universe would be created where life could be obtained. Or they say you just take any universe... And eventually, over trillions and trillions of years of galaxy formation and star formation and star death and star collapse, it's a matter of probability that sooner or later a solar system would be formed in which there was one planetary body, the planet Earth, which would be so fine-tuned that life would exist. Right? So, I can accept this. Sure. But what's the probability? Now, if you ask the mathematician professor, he says the probability is one over something. You know, like uh, in, in math, 1 over infinity equals 0. Now, strictly speaking, why? Why are you negating that 1? 
Why, strictly speaking, in math, 1 over infinity should not equal 0. 0 is 0. And 1 over infinity, no matter how small that is, it is something. But it's saying that it's so negligible because you keep dividing it. It's infinitely divisible by infinity. Right? So when you keep infinitely dividing it, it becomes so insignificant, again treated as 0. So we circuit the same thing. We take the 1 over infinity argument on your multiverse. That probability is so infinitesimal, I mean so extremely small, we will treat it as zero using this principle of math of 1 over infinity equals zero. The chance that of such a finely tuned condition for life happen on its own, the probability of that is 1 over infinity, we will treat it as zero. That, According to math, that means there's zero chance that this world came into existence on its own. That means it's logically necessary that there was a creator who brought it into existence. And you'd be amazed how if you ever research this fine-tuning argument, it's a jeep. Even the human being. Your 98.6 temperature, if I were to take that 20% plus or minus, you wouldn't be able to live. And any doctor will tell you how incredibly fine-tuned the human being is, and as soon as the tuning goes out, that's the process of death beginning. And that's just one, we're, we're just a speck. A human being is a speck on Karachi. Karachi is a dot on Pakistan. Pakistan is a speck. We're a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck. This is our reality in the universe. Once I asked, uh, I took three courses in astrophysics as an undergrad in Chicago. This was way back in 92. And my TA, he was an atheist. And me and him used to sit back in the lab and, mashallah, have discussions. So, and now, these, now these are jokes I'm telling. This is not serious argument, but just to lighten it up a little bit for you, right? So some of the things I would talk about with him and so other such people, right? So I so said, and actually this was in the third course of astrophysics was all about this, the creation of Big Bang and all that stuff, right? So I said, okay, no, I have no problem with the Big Bang. I have absolutely no problem. But I can believe that Allah Ta'ala, when He said, Kun, Fayakun, so He just said, Kun, the Big Bang happened, and Fayakun, the university came into existence. I said, you have a problem with the small bang. He said, what? I said, you have a problem with the small bang. What is that? That you accept that the universe just came into existence, and I'm telling you, Adam Alay, some one small speck came into existence with that parent. You said, that's not possible. He must have evolved from apes. I said, you accept the big bang, and you don't accept the small bang. Allah Akbar Kabira. I said, Ajeeb. <laughs> then when we came to this issue of probability, I said, okay, fine. Let's say I accept the multiverse argument that eventually the laws of probability over trillions of years would be number one, that the universe is created. Number two, that this finely tuned solar system. All of that stuff. I'm telling you, it's one over infinity. I said, accept that. I said, okay. In recorded human history, recorded human history means roughly, if I remember from history, 3000 BC or 2000 BC up till now. Let's just say we take it 500 BC. That's, everybody would be happy with that. Plato, so the time of Socrates, and Plato, recorded human history in 2000, 500 years. Shouldn't one paperclip just came into existence? <laughs> I mean, if the whole Big Bang happened and the universe came out of nowhere, couldn't it have just came into existence? Now what happens when you go back, they have other theories. There's another theory that, no, the world was always here. So it's not like the Big Bang is the only thing they believe in. There's a whole other theory that the whole universe was always here. There's no bang. It was always here. Now if you take that, I will then now show you another argument, which is the Kalam cosmological argument. All right? The Kalam, I'm still on slide number 11. The Kalam cosmological argument. So this is now taken if the world was always here. The first one was that we also agree that the world wasn't always here. So either you say Allah Ta'ala created it, or you say the Big Bang happened, right? Okay. Just out of sheer probability that this would take place. So that I did with the fine-tuning argument. Second, they will come back to and say, no, no, fine, forget that. Forget Big Bang, forget everything, forget multiverse, forget probability. This world was always here. They say, okay. Now, the light-hearted response, okay, I believe in Allah Ta'ala that was always around. You believe in a physical universe that is always around, <laughs> Right? Both of us are believing in something that has no origin. That itself is a non-scientific concept. To have anything in existence that does not have an origin. And in the classical text of Ibn Qalam, they used to talk about this. That Allah Ta'ala is the only being that is غير مسبوق adam, That He has never been preceded by non-existence. He has always been. They take the same concept and use it for the world. The second 
argument to say the world has always been there, right? It's okay, you say the world has no origin, we say Allah has no origin, right? You want us to give you the proof of who created Allah, yes, who created the universe, right? That's the light-hearted response. Now this Kalam cosmologic argument, and it's very interestingly, one of these Western Christian philosophers, his name is William Lane Craig, William Lane Craig, he was trying to discover a philosophical way to refute. So one is the logical way, one is the scientific way, one is the philosophical way to refute atheism. His research led him to our own Ilm al-Kalam. SubhanAllah. Our own Muslim youth don't even know Ilm al-Kalam. Huh? And Western philosophers who are engaged with atheists, they're going to Ilm al-Kalam. So he calls it the Kalam, he at, and he rightly in the his intellectual honesty. He didn't try to hijack it or plagiarize it. He calls it, and it's, it's, he, it's taught. I was taught it at Oxford. It's called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. Alhamdulillah, hamar to dil khush ho gaya. Us professor se Kalam ka lafz nikalte hue dekha. Hmm? Ha ha. Allah Akbar. Kalam Cosmological Argument. All right. Now understand what is that? What is the Kalam Cosmological Argument? All right. Let me try to explain this to you in a simple way. By the way, for the fine tuning argument, there's an astronomer by the name of Fred Hoyle. Fred Hoyle. If you want to look a bit more at that, uh, I actually got a quotation from him. He said, The probability of the universe emerging out of random forces or by chance, this is al as calculated by astronomer Fred Hoyle, the probability of the universe emerging out of random forces or by chance is less than the probability of a hurricane sweeping through a junkyard and assembling the 747 jumbo aircraft. <laughs> Yeah, but in theory, I mean, if inf infinite numbers of hurricanes pass through a junkyard, forget junkyard, a Boeing factory, I'll go one step further than that. A Boeing factory, well, all the parts are completely laid out perfectly. A Boeing factory, where all the parts are completely laid out perfectly, what's the probability that a hurricane that sweeps through manages to assemble and screw every nut and bolt into place? Now, if the universe could have happened through such random forces and I told the eh, called paperclip to watch, eh? <laughs> out of all the time shouldn't it, a little bit of steel wrapped itself into a perfectly formed paperclip is there any in any human history has anybody recorded this that a pencil came out of nowhere a paperclip out of nowhere this came out of nowhere anything even a single seed <laughs> through just random chance forces of probability right but here so I, I, the reason I give you these names is that you should know <laughs> Everybody just knows there were Richard Dawkins. There's a whole other world out there. There's a whole other, and we have a big problem in our university campuses here in Pakistan. That you have Dokken toting. Yes, I myself have seen it on a campus. Dokken toting, like they sometimes call it Bible toting. Dokken toting professors who carry Dawkins around and put it on their desk and they're totally preaching Dawkins in their classes, which their class has nothing to do with even this topic. They're completely abusing their position as a professor and a lecturer at a university to preach atheism to the Muslim students. Allahu Akbar Kabira. And there's no one who can even speak about it. You're not even allowed to raise your voice about it. This is a situation at very few, but at the more ultra-elite class, but highly academic standard, the ultra-elite high academic standard university of this country, which there are about two, three only, LAMS, IB, AKU, basically it would fall in that description. Sorry, voice. Yeah. But uh, there's some serious, serious atheism going on. Serious. Khair. So what was I doing? The Kalam. Kalam cosmological. Right. Okay. So the first thing is necessity, contingency, and logical fallacy. Necessity is what in Arabic called wajibul wujud. That which must necessarily exist. Contingency means its existence is contingent. It's just a fancy word for dependent on something else. So let me first show you the Islamic understanding, right? Because I want to show you both. So the Islamic understanding is what? Right? I'm not going to... For second, I will do how the Kalam argument can respond to that concept that the universe was always here. Right? First, within our own tradition, how do we understand these things? So we understand that Allah Ta'ala alone is wajibul wujud. He is the only being who necessarily exists. We are all mumkin al wujud. We possibly exist. We could also have not existed. In other words, our non-existence was also possible. Allah Ta'ala not existing, not possible. Me and you non-existing, possible. 
This is why so many of the great now bring in spiritual approach. People they used to make du'at Allah just for, for this. Allah Ta'ala, you brought me into existence. If you didn't create me, I wouldn't even exist. <laughs> I wouldn't even be if I wasn't in your irada of kun for yakun. Hmm? And then there's one thing that is called mumtaniul wujud. Something that cannot exist. And what is that? That is a shriek to Allah Ta'ala. That is another God, another divinity. So that we view as mumtaniul wujud. It's not possible that there's another God. This is our system. Now I'm showing you from our internal understanding. Wajibul wujud, mumkinul wujud, mumtanil wujud. Alright. Now that which is mumkinul wujud, that which possibly exists, its existence is dependent on contingent on that being who necessarily exists. Tell us, why do you mean you exist? Because Allahul Khalik, that Zat who is wajibul wujud, He created us. Otherwise, mean you wouldn't have existed. There's only one thing, there's only one factor that determined the, us realizing the possibility or not. And that's Allah Ta'ala's creative power. There's nothing else that went into it. There's no other factor. There's no random forces. Problem. There's nothing else. There's one and one and only causal mechanism that brought us into existence when it was completely possible we didn't exist. And that was the will and wish and might and power and creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now, when we will continue to exist in Akhirah, that is because Allah Ta'ala is al Hayyul Qayyum. He will live forever, the pre-eternal and the ever-eternal. Now, we will also be eternal, but not because of our own ability. No. Because of Allah Ta'ala's izn, Allah Ta'ala's irada, Allah Ta'ala's wish and will and desire that we live forever. Alright? Okay. Now I'll explain to you the logical fallacy in a moment. So now everything is either necessarily exists. Now necessarily also means istighna, it's independent. It's not dependent on anything else for its existence and creation. I mean we're dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's our Rabb, He's our Razak. He's our Rabb, He's our Razak. Okay, the other thing is something that's contingent because it is dependent on something else for its existence. All right. Now look at the Kalam cosmological argument. It works as follows. Step number one. Everything that exists in our world, everything that exists in the universe, will have to either exist independently on its own, or its existence is contingent and dependent on some other existence. Its existence is contingent and dependent on some other existence. Alright. Now, second principle that anything that falls in the first category, so again we're on slide number 11 here, anything that falls in the first category of necessary existence, anything that falls under the category of, sorry, anything that falls under the category of contingent existence, contingent existence cannot fall in the first category of necessary existence. First we have to set them as two categories. Second step, they are mutually exclusive categories. Because you cannot be independent and dependent simultaneously, to put it more simple. Your existence is either independent or dependent. If it's dependent, there's no way it can be independent. If your existence is contingent, there's no way it can be necessary. Alright. Now, every single thing cannot fall in the first category. Because if it did, then everything would be pre-eternal. And that goes against our both empirical and experiential understanding of the world. Right? So that's clear. Number three, not everything falls in the first category. Step one, there are these two categories. Step two, these two are mutually exclusive. Step three, not everything is in category one. And even science doesn't. So this is something nobody thinks that every single thing, you've always been there, this watch has always been there, this laptop has always existed. Nobody can think like that. Alright? Okay. So because not every single thing is in category one, not every single thing is in category one, then all these things that are in category two, there must be something that brought it into existence, that upon which it was dependent and contingent must precede its existence, because existence of B is contingent and dependent on A, right? So existence of A must precede B. It's that conclusion, that there are things that exist due to their contingency and dependency on 
other things that must have necessarily existed before them and those things necessitated bringing them into existence. So then, the question is that that which is it dependent on, that itself is either going to be either necessary or contingent. Right? So for example, you were created, brought about into creation. Your existence is contingent dependent on your parents. Now, your parents will ask, we'll take one step back. Are your parents contingent to necessary creation? You say they're contingent. They were also dependent on something. Okay, we go back. Who were they dependent on? You said they're their own parents. So your grandparents. We'll keep asking the question. We'll keep going back, right? Until we reach something that must be necessarily existent. Let me now put it to you in another way. If you say something is existence is contingent, that means it must be dependent on something else, right? When it's dependent on something else, you will ask that question about that. Something else is that something else, existence, necessary or contingent. If you say, no, that's also contingent, I'll keep taking it back. You cannot take it back infinity. That's a logical fallacy. There must be traced back to something that is necessarily existent. You cannot not have infinite progression of contingency. That's a logical fallacy. In Arabic it's called door. You can't have door. They will say, lazim a door. That what happens is you're going round and round forever. <laughs> round and round forever. It's not possible. It's not possible. And logic will not accept this. It's a logical fallacy. That you have an endless stream of contingent beings, everything brought into existence by something that itself is dependent on something that brought into existence, that itself is dependent. You cannot do that. You cannot have infinite progression on that. It's a logical fallacy. So what does it mean? It must necessarily be traced back to some being that is necessary. Necessary existence. Necessary existence. Right? So if you're going back that same time, so we call it infinite regression, you, you can't have that. All right. All right. Now, still a person will object and say, okay, what? They will say, that, okay, if all events need causes, what you said is every contingent being has a cause and that cause will either be themselves contingent or necessary but you can't have infinite regression so ultimately you will have to reach a cause that is necessary existence but your first proposition was that everything needs a cause so doesn't that thing that is necessarily existent also need a cause? Right? So some people will ask this question well who created God then? That's how they're framing it. If you say everything is created then who created God then? Right? So this is also, this is a logical fallacy called a category fallacy. Because Allah Ta'ala is in the category of necessary existence. Necessary existence by definition doesn't need a cause. Not only does it not need a cause, it's without a cause. <laughs> necessary means non-dependent, non-causal existence. So to ask this question, it's like saying what is the cause of that non-causal existence? That's a category fallacy. It's like asking what color is sound? Sound doesn't have color. It, that is a question that doesn't apply to this category. You can say, what volume is the sound? Right? So to ask the question, what is the cause of that being who is necessary? That's a category fallacy in logic. By definition, being necessary means there was no cause. Alright? Okay. Or if you say, for example, who made God? It's like saying, who made the unmakeable? But necessary means unmakeable, non-created uncreated. So it's like saying who created the uncreated. What caused that necessary, if something caused the necessary existence to come into being, it's not necessary, it's contingent. <laughs> it's contingent, you put it back in the other category. If you keep putting everything back in that category, you can't have everything in the category of contingent because you have infinite regression, that's a logical fallacy. Alright? So this is the Kalam cosmological argument. Now this basically revolves around these three concepts that we showed you on slide 11, necessity, contingency, and the logical fallacy here was what we told you, this infinite regression. Door, you can't have that. You can't have it, it won't go on forever. You ultimately will have to have something. All right? Imam al-Ghazairim al explain this in another way. That if you look at the times the earth rotates around the sun, so that's once in a year, 
That's once in a year. However, if you look at the time that the moon rotates around the earth, that's 12 times in a year. 12 times in a year. Now go back to the lunar calendar. There were 12 lunar months, right? 12 times in a year. All right. Now if you say the sun and the moon have both existed forever, right? The sun and the moon have both existed forever. So then you will be bringing their number of revolutions in the past to infinity. But at the same time, you're saying that the moon had 12 times more revolutions than the sun. So A equals 12 times B. But math will tell you if A equals infinity and B equals infinity, and A equals 12 times B, A equals B. <laughs> because 12 times infinity is also infinity. 12 times infinity is also infinity. So A equals B. So A equals B what? 1 equals 12. <laughs> huh? <laughs> right? If you talk about the current situation that somebody believes that the world, so we just took two aspects of the world, right? So put it rather put it this way, when the sun and the moon you take infinite regression, they both reach infinity. So then infinity equals infinity, not that one equals twelve. Infinity equals infinity. So when infinity equals infinity, then the number of revolutions of the moon around the earth and the number of revolutions of the earth around the sun are equal. But how can they be equal when you just said the moon has twelve times the amount of revolutions than the sun does every year? So there's different ways they use this system of the Kalam argument, right? All right. Here, there is actually much more to tell you. I'm going to put one slide up and I'm going to skip this few. The third thing was the transcendental argument. So it's there and you will be getting the slides. It will be there on the website uh, for those of you who are sitting uh, because I have a couple of more things to do. We still have to do the rationality part. Okay, so this was a little bit about science. I told you this is a whole world. The point was just to show you that there is a conceptual understanding in Deen that can engage in this discussion, right? And on the other side, the conceptual understanding should not be called science, it's called scientism, right? Now we have to move to this issue of rationality, okay? All right, rationality. Now, Imam Ghazali can look at, uh, number 12 is not titled, slide 12 says the transcendental argument. That was a chart, uh, I put that for you here, slide number 11. So what you see on the bottom of slide 11, transcendental argument, that is explained to you in slide number 12. Move to slide number 13, now rationality and religion. Slide number 14, rationality first in terms of nubuwa and revelation, revelation and prophethood. So Imam Ghazali Rumulatala had a beautiful way to explain this concept. What he did was, it's called an epistemological approach. Epistemology is a fancy word which means studying knowledge and the way we know things. So there's a way of knowing and then there's the things that are knowable by that way of knowing, all right? So he takes number one, what's the first way of knowing is our five senses, right? So that begins even according to modern human embryology, that starts even in the womb, and then a baby develops different levels of skills, right? So there's a way of knowing which is using your five senses. There's certain knowables that you will know through that. You will know, and this is what babies are doing all the time. They want to throw something. They want to hear if it's loud or not. They want to put something in his mouth and see is it hard or soft or bitter or sweet or not. This is the constant way they're knowing. This is their learning. They're using their five senses. All right, fine. We accept the way of knowing, five senses. We accept the knowables that are known through that way of knowing. Second, second way of knowing, he says, that per progresses in human development is your uncle. Then a child can begin to fathom concepts. They can understand concepts. They can intellectualize concepts. Now in our tradition that this moment is, starts, peaks, re, not peak, start, how would I say, this, this ability matures, it, the development of the intellect matures at the age of seven. And that's why then Sayyidina Rasulullah, he sallallahu alayhi wa taught us to really begin tarbiyah in earnest. It doesn't mean you don't do any tarbiyah before seven. I have a six-year-old. But you begin tarbiyah in earnest at the age of seven. Because the ability to fully grasp, especially things as right and wrong, moral, immoral, pleasing to Allah Ta'ala, displeasing to Allah Ta'ala, this intellectualization of concepts and understanding, which start, it, it reaches a maturity at the age of seven. Not peak, because it keeps going. Not peak, but maturity means it developed, it's there now. It's, it's an ability now that the child has. All right? So then through the akal, which means through your mind, you're able to know many things. So for example, there may be some of you who have never been to New York, right? So you, your five senses have not experienced New York, right? 
You have not live seen it, smelt it, heard it, touched it, etc. But your uncle tells you it exists. You know with as much certainty that Newark exists as I do. I was born and raised there. Why? I won't say that, no, no, I know it was more certain than you do because your five senses don't experience. So we acknowledge the aql is a tool of knowledge. It's a way of knowing. And we acknowledge the knowables that are known by that way of knowing. Okay, that's done. Now, then, the, what Imam Azali does in the third level is now he looks and he takes it in reverse. He says there's a way of knowing called the five senses, certain things that are known by the five senses. And we can trace their knowledge back to the five senses. Then there's a certain thing that is called the akal. And there's certain things known by the akal and we can trace their knowledge back to the akal. Then he starts here that there's a third set of knowledge. And those things that are making a claim, let's say in the first instance, a claim to be knowledge, that cannot be traced back to the five senses and that cannot be traced back to the akal. What is making what makes that claim to knowledge revelation and prophethood? Wahi and Nabuwa, Quran and Sunnah. The Quran is not something that came from our five senses, and it's not something that came from our akal, but is making a claim it's knowledge. But the source of that knowledge is not the five senses, nor is it the akal. The Sunnah, Nabuwa, teachings of Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is also making a claim that this is knowledge, right? But the source of that knowledge is not the five senses, nor is it the akal. So, so, okay, now what do you do? Now, very interesting because he's well before modern science, right? He's well before this whole modern science concept of scientific method is well after Ghazali. But Imam Ghazali actually adopts very much what today we would call a scientific method because he goes for that falsifiability thing. So he says, okay, look, there's some things that claim to be knowledge and you didn't know them through your five senses and you don't know them through your akal. So what you should do, you should try, test them out. So he takes example, he gives you an example, for example, one of his work examples of Hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu said, that if you make pleasing Allah ta'ala, your first and foremost concern and worry in your heart, Allah ta'ala will remove all the concerns and worries you have in the world. So let's run the box, you know what I'm saying? Okay, this is a proposition. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa now let's just, it's not the proper other way to phrase it, but just right now for you to understand, it's a claim to knowledge. All right? For somebody who, at this moment, only thinks that their only tools of knowledge are the five senses and their akal. Because the five senses could never come up with this. Remember, the, self the five senses can't come up with this. The five senses cannot establish this to be true, that if you make the concern of your heart, the sole concern of your heart, pleasing Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala will remove all your worldly worries and concerns, your five senses can't establish that. The akal can't establish that. This is beyond the ken, beyond the ability of rationality. The rational intellect cannot establish this position. The so Imam Ghazali says, okay, what you do then, is you adopt the position and see what happens. You run a test. <laughs> you run a test. You do it. <laughs> You make the only concern in your heart pleasing Allah Ta'ala and you see, does Allah Ta'ala remove your worries and concerns in the world? And if you find that Allah Ta'ala does remove your worries and concerns in the world, so you will realize that the statement is true. You will realize the statement is true. And he says, do it. And he says, do it with every single verse in Hadith. This is the challenge he gives. He said, do it with everyone. Do it with everyone. Now remember tawatta, remember correlation, remember intuition. Remember that's the scientific method that you keep running the experiment and there's a certain number of times you run it that you feel that yes, fine, now I know it's theory of uniformity. I will say this is uniform. Bring all that back in. When I run it a certain number of times, I will do it. Imam Musa says he's even more precise. He doesn't say approximate. He doesn't say try it on 10% of the Hadith and 10% of the Quran or 40%. He says try it on all. <laughs> He says, take every verse of Quran and every hadith of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and practice it. So it's actually the perfection of the scientific method. It's the complete test. Every single variable completely tested. And he says, if you find through your experience that all of them bear out to be true, then you will know with yakin that the source of that knowledge, because now you know the nobles to be true. If the nobles are true, whatever was the source of that noble is true. Now the source of that noble, the source of verse of Quran and Hadith is not five senses, it's not your akal, it's Allah Ta'ala, Quran, and Sayyidina Rasulullah Hadith. 
So when you know the nobles to be true through your test and experience, you will know the source of those nobles to be true. You will know Allah Ta'ala and Sayyidina Rasulullah some to be true with certainty. Allah Akbar Kabeera. Ajeeb Imam Allah Ta'ala. So that challenge is there today also for anyone. <laughs> In fact, I don't even, before the non-Muslims take it up, the Muslims have to take it up. <laughs> there are a lot of things you don't realize. Say not Rasulullah, Allah SWT, Allah Ta'ala said in Quran, lower your gaze. Try it. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> you want, no, I don't want to lower my gaze. Can you give me a cure, Shaykh? <laughs> right? That doesn't work. We, we, we know not the claim. We're also scientific. <laughs> we make no claim. Deen of Islam makes no claim that you can disobey it and still succeed. You want a way that I can I still have hayal and not commit these crude, lewd sins on the screen even though I don't lower my gaze? Deen doesn't make any claim it's going to teach you that. No way. We don't have that claim. There's no hidayah like that that you disobey Allah SWT and you can still get obedience. <laughs> and that's also a logical fallacy. And Deen says you try it. Do what Allah Ta'ala told you to do and then see if you get hayal. Build that workshop. Now spiritual approach. Build that workshop. Don't just build a workshop for your little academic intellectual understandings. Build a workshop I want to see every single thing in the Quran and every single thing Sayyidina Rasulullah some taught me about how I get haya. Then I will follow Imam Ghazali Ramadan's approach. I will practice each and every one of those things. And then you will see when you get that haya and you will have yakin on your deen. You will have yakin on your deen. You will say, look at this deen. It's Kamil Hidayah. It changed my heart. It changed my life. It transformed my being. Hmm? This is called deen. You have to get real. Hmm? This all this not practicing Quran and Sunnah and basically philosophizing and intellect. And I, I, I'm indulging you, but don't. This is not the asal. Hmm? I tell you very openly. We just do these type of lectures to take people out of the jail of their akal. Hmm? It's like a jailbreak. <laughs> yeah. I'm breaking you out of the jail of your akal so you can enter the life of your kalb. <laughs> My dream isn't that you go home and you start building a workshop on Iman and you write me all types of interesting intellectual questions. Go build a workshop on haya. Build a workshop on sabr. Build a workshop on taqwa. Then see what happens. Then use Imam Ghazali's method. Or you will come to such a yakin. You will say, I was a rock. I was a rock. I thought nothing could change me. <laughs> I was a rock. I was full of anger and full of lust and full of envy. Oh, I did this. I did what Imam Zahim Ta'ala said. I did whatever Allah Ta'ala said in Quran and Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught me. And I changed. Oh, I have yakin. Then you will have true yakin. Because this is Imam Zahim thing also. This is epistemology. That knowledge through demonstration is knowledge. But he says knowledge through experience is a higher form of knowledge. This is our understanding. This, this is the understanding of the Islamic tradition. It's a higher form of knowledge than scientism can ever aspire to. Because scientism only believes in knowledge through demonstration. We believe in knowledge through experience. What will you experience? You will experience the qurb with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody who's experienced that qurb doesn't need to be demonstrated that Allah ta'ala exists. Allah ta'ala says the Quran, make sajda, you will get qurb. You will get qurb, you will feel it. Allah says, remember me, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ You make zikr of me, I will make zikr of you. You will feel it. You will feel Allah Ta'ala making zikr of you. That you will know He's true, you will know He is real. You won't ask for any logical proof then. You won't even need this kalam cosmological argument. That was just to break, that's just the key to unlock the jail. <laughs> Once you're out of jail, you don't even need these things. This is now again carrying to what I told you yesterday about akal and kalb, akal and kalb. Hmm? When that starts, you don't need these things. This is what Imam Zahra said, that Quran and Sunnah is ultimately to be lived. It's not just to be taught and translated and commented and analyzed and discussed. The Quran and Sunnah was to be lived. And that's lived by heart. Whose heart lived it? Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam's heart was living Quran. And he brought Sahaba Ikram, he brought their hearts alive. This is called Tazki and Deen, where you zakki him. It means to bring the hearts alive. Make it alive in their heart. Hmm? Well, here, this was this notion of Imam Ghazali Matal. So that means what I, this is my own term, I call it the super rational. It's not, Deen is not irrational. It's super, it transcends rationality. 
Rationality and intellect is a weak scale. You know, like if you go to the jeweler, so the jeweler has a small little scale that can weigh maybe to like to up to like 10 pounds or 1 pound because he's weighing in 0 0.0003 grams and ounces gold. If I put my whole suitcase on that scale, the scale will bust. <laughs> the scale doesn't have the ability. Akal is like the scale of the jeweler. <laughs> it cannot grasp. Go back now to slide number, oh, slide number 6. Akal can't do this. <laughs> the ilm of Allah Ta'ala, Allahul Alim. And the ilm he reveals, his revealed ilm called Wahi Quran al Kareem, Allah al Insana ma lam ya'lam. Allah Ta'ala will teach humanity knowledge which they never could have known and they never knew. Allah Ta'ala gave them a scale. <laughs> a scale. They were running around with their small little jeweler akal scales, trying to figure out what is true and real and what is false and what is untrue. Allah Ta'ala said, No, no, don't worry about this. <laughs> now, can you imagine that the akal is a scale? That is big enough. Now to the other side. Bring it back to yesterday. Yes, it's a small jeweler scale relative to the ilm of Allah Ta'ala. Right? That's a one over infinity again. Right? One is your ability to know. And infinity is Allah Ta'ala's knowledge. al alim So one over infinity is what? Zero. <laughs> but that one is something. Because that one little pure innate akal Allah Ta'ala gave us was enough afala yaqilun, enough to understand the existence of Allah Ta'ala. So imagine that then. That if this inherent small little jeweler scale that Allah Ta'ala gave us called our akal is enough to understand and realize the existence of Allah Ta'ala, then imagine what happens to the human being, the transformative effect of the human being when he moves beyond that small scale of akal and gets into the ocean of the ilm of Quran and Sunnah, what type of marifat of Allah Ta'ala will he have? That's called marifat. What type of deep understanding of Allah Ta'ala you will have? When he understands Allah Ta'ala as Allah Ta'ala has revealed himself to be. Lillahi al-asma'ul husna fudu biha. When he understands Allah Ta'ala as Allah Ta'ala wishes himself to be known. Huwa ma'akum aina ma'kuntum fa inni kareeb. What will happen to that person then? So the akal can't handle that. There's something else Allah Ta'ala gives us our sadr. He told the Nabi Kareem, Alam nashrah laka sadrak. It's your sadr. These understandings come in your breast. What's in your breast, your kalb, your spiritual heart? So the understanding of the sadr and the kalb is way beyond any understanding the akal can have. And you want to leave the deen, you want to leave the understanding of sadr and kalb and deen and just be reading Dawkins and talking about atheism which is a matter of the akal? I'm just trying to unlock you from this little small solitary confinement, small jail cell of akal. <laughs> when you come out of that, you will end up in the in unlimited expanses and pastures of the true deen, of the knowledge of Qur'an and Sunnah, and of the pastures of your heart. So you have to understand, and you have to keep all of these things in context. You have to keep all of these things in a context. Alright? So we're going to stop over here. And inshallah ta'ala this was some very, very, very preliminary, very small drop. But at the end, what I tried to do, and I tell you very openly, I'm very conscious and self-conscious, and I want you to be very conscious and self-conscious. My personal view is that this drop is enough. I could sit down and give you the whole course on atheism and religion, existence of evil and this and that. Oh, there's so many topics. But for me, because I'm addressing you people, Right? That's different if I was talking to atheists and that's a whole different engagement. right? But for the person who has iman in their heart, this drop is enough. This drop is enough for you to know our deen has an academic intellectual tradition. But it's also to be realized that the ocean lies in the spiritual tradition of my deen. My deen has engaged my akal. But the real engagement is the way the deen has engaged my kalb. Allah tells us about Quran. Inna fi dhikra liman kana lahu qalb that indeed in this Quran this is there's an admonishment and advice but for who liman kana lahu qalb for that person who has a heart <laughs> not for that person who has an akal for that person who has a heart oh they will be guided by Quran they will be transformed by Quran they will be uplifted by Quran but if I put that topic up five of you would show up hmm? yeah <laughs> I put this thing up, science, rationality, and the new atheism, that you flock to it. This is the problem. (laughs) 
This is the problem. Hmm? If I put heart spirituality in Quran, <laughs> I get 10% of the attendance. Hmm? I didn't do this to get you to come, but I did this because clearly this is an issue that's disturbing you, so I want to talk to you about it. I don't want you to think that Islam has nothing to say about these things. But I want you to understand it from the vantage point and perspective of deen. This is a speck for us. This is just a dot on the map. This is an incidental discussion. So why did that which deen views as a very incidental discussion? People today are making it the be all and end all of their decision whether it's to stay on iman, la hola la quota, la bila, or leave their iman. It's a big problem. So maybe part of the problem is because you haven't had these type of sessions. Allah alam, we don't know. We are desperately trying to figure out <laughs> how to help these people who are getting distant from their Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have no idea. Allah ta'ala knows best. So here we pause over here. We make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Accept our sitting here. May He grant us the khair in it. May He save us from any confusion and error in it. May He just accept our intention and our niyyah in the amal bin niyat that are niyyah in every and any Islamic gathering and endeavor and every ever learning and discussion is only and only to become closer to Him only and only to become more pleasing to him. May Allah Ta'ala keep us on such a niyyah. May he let us die on this niyyah. May he raise us up in this niyyah. And may he honor this niyyah by granting us that abu and dar salam jannah akhirah where we actually get what we want. And that's not objectivity, subjectivity, rationality. We get what we want. And that is the closeness to Allah Ta'ala, belovedness to Allah Ta'ala, nearness to Allah Ta'ala. Wa akhir da'wana. And alhamdulillah, bin alameen. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.